I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Advocacy at Home, with the Ehlers Danlow Society's very own Shaney Weber. My name is Sarah Ritchie. I'm the volunteer coordinator at the Ehlers Danlow Society, and I'm your moderator today. This webinar is not only a part of our ongoing series, Living with EDS and HSD, it is also a special webinar for May Awareness Month. So this is how today's webinar is going to work. All webinar attendees will be muted at all times during the webinar. If we have time at the end of the webinar, Shaney will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. So what that means is that at any point during the webinar, you are able to type any questions you may have into the question box at any time. And please make sure you're putting your questions in the question box and not chat. I can't guarantee I'll see your question in chat. So just to make sure we get to it, put them in the question box. Shaney will not be able to see or respond to any of those questions until the end of her presentation. Please don't send your questions more than once. It doesn't increase your chances of having your question answered, and it'll only make it harder for us to sift through those questions to make sure we can get to as many as possible. Now, after spending many years as a special education teacher, Shaney Weber had to step back from teaching due to hypermobile EDS and became a volunteer here at the Ehlers Danlow Society in 2012. Since then, Shaney has done some wonderful things to benefit the EDS and HSD community and is now on our staff as our community and advocacy director. Not only does Shaney moderate INSPIRE, which is the society's online support community, but she also assists patients and doctors from around the world that reach out to our helpline. Along with those two roles, Shaney is also a patient advocate and speaks with national and state government representatives and the medical community about EDS, HSD, and the issues that our community faces. In addition to all of that, Shaney co-founded and co-leads the Maryland EDS group, and I personally have the honor of working alongside with her during the Junior Zebra program. Thank you so much for being with us today, Shaney. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Welcome everybody. We're so glad that you could join us. Happy May EDS and HSD Awareness Month. Uh, this is the most unusual awareness month, isn't it? And we're having to think of ways that we can raise awareness um, while we are, are spending time at home. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see. Mm. Joe, I'm looking for my Should be there now. Oh. Nope. Nope. I'm closing that. Give me just one moment. Oh, yes, that is. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. Uh, can everybody uh, see my screen? Um, the slides being shared. Can you put up your hands, please? Oh, yes, good. Hands raised. Yay. <laughs> Not being the most tech savvy person, I always have to double check <laughs> that I actually did that successfully. <laughs> you got it today. Yay. All right. There we go. Um, so we're going to talk today about uh, what kind of advocacy can you do from home? Uh, there's actually quite a bit that you can do. Uh, is everyone familiar with what advocacy is, though? Uh, advocacy is an ongoing process of building partnerships with other people um, so that you can get others to act for you or with you. Um, not only for support, but uh, so that you can get them to act. You can get them to do something, right? Whether you are wanting uh, people to donate uh, to search, or whether you are wanting them to introduce a bill, um, a law uh, that would uh, impact those living with types of EDS or HSD. Uh, whatever you are wanting somebody, um, advocacy is what you do to get them to do what it is you want them to do.
toolkit uh, for the EDS and HSD community, uh, the first thing you want to do is learn all you can about all the types of ehlers danlos syndromes and hypermobility spectrum disorders. All about your topic. To, in order to raise awareness, to educate others, uh, to have laws introduced, you really want to know about these conditions. You want to know what the state of research is. What are things we know? What are things we don't know? What are research priorities? Uh, things like that can help you know um, what kind of fundraising is necessary or help you know um, who to talk to. For instance, if you are identifying uh, that we need more research in, let's say, um, pelvic disorders uh, in, in those living with a type of EDS or HSD. Um, you can learn about what is already known about pelvic disorders um, for those that have these conditions, and you can identify who are the researchers um, that you can talk with uh, and try to convince them to do research uh, specifically on pelvic disorders uh, as they relate to EDS and HSD. Um, and so you want to learn all about these conditions. On our website at ehlerstanlos.com, we have a lot of information about these conditions. And you can also look at all kinds of webinars and conference presentations on our YouTube channel. Um, you can use sources as well, like Google Scholar, or PubMed. You can use um, sites like, uh, um, I'm trying to think, uh, clinicaltrials.gov um, and look at who is writing the research. That's how you can identify who to talk to if research is where your interest is. Or if your interest is in government advocacy, look at those government websites. Uh, get to know who heads the various departments, who introduces bills, who are your elected representatives. Um, learn about these things. The more you know, the better you are going to be able to advocate for our community, the better you'll be able to raise awareness, to educate others, and to change laws. The very basics of advocacy. This is whether you are raising uh, awareness and education, if you are advocating at home, or if at, at some point when we can leave our homes, if you're doing advocacy out in the community. Have a goal. What is your goal? What are you advocating for? Have reasonable expectations. Learn about your topic. We talked about that one, didn't we? And practice. I should probably write on there, practice, and then write again, practice, and then write on there, practice. Um, that's how you gain self-confidence uh, and how you can come across as a knowledgeable source of information. Another basic is building partnerships. Advocacy is not about battles. It's not about us versus them. It's about building relationships, building partnerships. That's how you can get things done strengthening those partnerships. And finally, being confident, believing in yourself, knowing that you can, that you can increase um, what people know about these conditions, that you can teach other people about these conditions, and that you can help facilitate more research. You can change laws or government 
guidelines um, in ways that help those living with these conditions. Let's start with making a goal. Sometimes you may want to uh, represent those living with a type of EDS or HSD. Or sometimes you may want to represent all of those living with a rare disease. Or you want to represent all chronic pain conditions. What is your goal? Who are you representing? Know also who are the decision makers. If you want to make change, who do you need to talk to? Who is uh, able to make decisions in the government? Who's able to make decisions on what type of research is done in a, in a college or in a medical center, in a department of health? Know who else is advocating on this issue. You may have allies that are advocating for the same thing that you can connect with, the combined sources, uh, combine your resources. And know that your story has power. Uh, you're going to want to rely on your story uh, instead of attempting to be an expert of the of any particular issue your story and the story of others in our community can be very powerful that also enables you though to not have to be an expert of all facets of an issue learn about them be knowledgeable about them but know the strength of your story Have reasonable expectations. Reasonable expectations uh, include things like knowing it takes time to make change. It takes time for uh, educating all the doctors in your community about these conditions. It takes time to raise the amount of funds necessary to do research that is sorely needed. It takes time to introduce an idea in the legislators' minds, um, to have that translate into a bill, and then later into being voted upon to become a law. Reasonable expectations also includes knowing that many people want to be hurt. There's lots of people out there advocating for all kinds of things. Um, you're not the only voice out there. And so one of the things you want to think about is how can you connect with, with the decision makers? How can you stand out from other advocates? How can you make your voice heard? Making your message concise, making it powerful, uh, using words that really help others connect with you. These are, these are ways that um, you can help others hear your message, to care about your message, and to be willing to do what it is that you're asking them to do, or at least consider it. Know that not everyone's going to agree with you, and that's okay. You don't need everybody to agree with you. Just as you are going to be listening to what uh, the positions are of different decision makers, use your story, use your message to get as many people to agree as you can. And it's okay if not everyone does. And then, of course, advocacy is about growing those partnerships. You need to state your, your needs clearly. If, if 
let's go back to the EDS and HSD research for a moment as an example. Um, let's say you're advocating for, um, you want to, let, let's say we need to know more about headaches and migraines in those living with a type of EDS or HSD, right? You want researchers to research this. You get a meeting with um, a group of researchers, for example. Uh, going to that meeting, you don't want to um, be introduce yourself as angry. You don't want to be bombastic. You want to be approachable. You want to be friendly. You want to state your needs clearly. Um, when you go to this meeting, uh, you would want to be very specific. You wouldn't just say, I want research into EDS and HSD. You would want to say, there are many people in our community who have really bad headaches or migraines, and we don't know why. Some of the causes of headaches or migraines in those that have a type of EDS or HSD may be due to TMJ disorder, or maybe due to craniocervical instability, or there may be other causes, and we just don't know. We need researchers like you to study headaches and migraines in those living in these conditions to try to figure out why so many people have headaches and migraines. In this example that I just provided you, you're not assuming that people know all about EDS or HSD. You're not assuming that your audience that you're meeting with um, know all of the simple the symptoms that we may live with or know where there are holes in research uh, that we need more research done. And so in that example, you are helping them understand by describing what is known and what is not known. You're providing examples of what research has been done and piquing the interest, hopefully, for researchers to take, a, take on that research to find other causes, okay? When you're meeting with decision makers, as concise and simple of an explanation as you can is really going to win the day. But when you're building these partnerships, one little trick you can do is introduce it as a problem that the two of you, or the three of you, however many in the room, um, can solve together. What is this problem uh, that, you, that you see? What is this problem that you're having or that our community is having? Um, what are some problems? Uh, possible solutions that, that they could help you with. You don't want to just present the problem, but also remember what is it that you want them to do. Solve these problems together helps everybody at the table um, feel valued, uh, feel like they are part of the solution. And it's part of how you build partnerships, part of how you build relationships, right? It's like when you're making friends, uh, you've learned all of, all of these skills. And that's a lot of the same skills that you'll use in making partnerships. And sympathize uh, with the challenges and the pressures that the other person is under. Um, using words like, we and us and our really builds a connection instead of us and them. 
anytime you can find ways to laugh together. Whether you're talking with the, the person in line at the grocery store or whether you are um, speaking by phone with your, the staff member of your elected official, uh, making a connection uh, through laughter uh, is a great way to build those partnerships. When, it, when somebody does something for you, uh, be sure to compliment them, thank them. That's another way that, that you can continue to build these relationships. You may be asking yourself though, why is building partnerships such, such an important thing? Well, if you think about it, don't you feel like uh, you're more likely to help somebody who you have a relationship with versus somebody that you really don't know? Building these partnerships are how you can get the issues that are important to you front and center, that you can get the person who is a decision maker thinking about the issues that are important to you. And so use those skills that you have, have been learning ever since you were a young child of how do you make friends to build your partnerships. The stronger your partnerships, uh, the more progress you'll have having the issues that are important to you um, be addressed. <clears throat> Whenever you're doing advocacy work, you wanna make sure you know who all is involved. Not only who are the decision makers, but who else is advocating? Um, and are they advocating for the same things you are? Or maybe they're advocating for something completely different. But nonetheless, look for what you have in common. Where do you agree? Where are the issues that are important to you have in common with issues that are important to another advocate. Introduce yourself to other advocates. Introduce yourself to decision makers. You wanna grow your network, grow the number of people that you know, uh, grow the number of people who believe uh, the issues that are important to you are important because there are issues that are important to them. And please always thank you notes, thank people when you're talking with them. From home, we can still raise awareness and educate others. We can still advocate for, for laws to be changed and use um, our advocacy skills. Most people, when they are thinking about advocacy from home, immediately think about social media, right? You're thinking of, I can put a lot of posts on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, maybe on LinkedIn as well. So let's start there. Let's start with social media. When you are making posts to spread awareness and to educate others about these conditions and about issues that are important to, to those in our community, make sure the information you are posting is factual. Make sure it's accurate. One of the ways to do that is make sure it comes from a good source. What do I mean by a good source? Well, a good source um, is one that's respected by others. And so a good source, for instance, may be a medical journal article, or it may be information uh, that's being shared by a government, local or state or province or country. 
A, another good source may be national or international patient organizations like Fowler's Danlow Society. Sources that are not as well respected um, and that may be questioned for accuracy uh, are ones that, that maybe are, are uh, from somebody's blog or um, sharing somebody else's post. It may be accurate, it may not. And because of that, your audience may not trust or know that the information is accurate. And so when you are posting on social media, make sure the source that you are posting from is one that your audience respects, that the your audience can get information. When you are posting on social media, also think about um, sharing your reality. Different people feel feel come to a greater or lesser extent, um, but share share glimpses of what is it like to live with these conditions. You can focus um, your posts on issues that are important to you. Let's say, for example, the issue that is important to you is um, increasing wheelchair accessibility in your community. You want uh, curbs to have cutouts and you want um, buildings that have stairs to have a wheelchair accessible way to enter the buildings. And so information that you may be sharing may come from national um, organizations who are fighting for um, disability awareness and wheelchair accessibility. Uh, and when you're giving a glimpse into your reality, maybe you would share pictures of how, um, if you're in a wheelchair, how you, you can't enter a building. There's no way for you to go in. That's how you're tailoring your post, using factual information, but also giving a glimpse into your life that highlights issues that are important to you. Know that if you're sharing posts from the Ellers Danlow Society or uh, from the Centers for Disease Control, from the World Health Organization, um, from other good sources, from other reputable sources, um, that that information is going to be factual. And so those are things you can trust uh, that are okay to share. If you don't know for sure if a post it had, contains inf accurate information, uh, maybe you're sharing from a friend or something of this nature, research the accuracy before you share that post. Make sure you're not sharing information that's not true. Social media is not the only way that you can do advocacy from home though. Uh, something else you can do, you can host a virtual meeting with your family and friends. Like set up a Zoom meeting with your family and friends and teach them about types of EDS and HSD. I, I've always thought that, that your family and friends can be a great audience when you're trying to figure out what is your elevator speech. In other words, how can you very quickly and concisely uh, tell others what are EDS and HSD? Um, use them as, as um, kind of a focus group when you're trying out your message of what kinds of ways to say things are more effective than others. But, some of our family members and friends don't know anything about these conditions. And so you can actually spread awareness starting with your own family members and friends. That is a type of advocacy. Uh, from home, you can send awareness brochures through email or through the mail. Uh, our website has a section of brochures that you can print 
there at home. You can uh, download it as a PDF. Um, what if you uh, decided that for each day of May EDS and HSD Awareness Month, you are going to email or send uh, through the post postal service a brochure about what is EDS and what is HSD to each medical professional in your community. And if you're in a very small town, then, then branch out to every medical professional in your county or your state or your province. That's a way to spread awareness. That's another way to educate others. Another way that, that you can help spread awareness of these conditions is to tell us your story. Submit your story to us, and then we can share your story across our social media platforms so that your story and what's important to you what issues are important to you can be a great way to spread awareness and to highlight issues that you value. Of course, something that, that uh, can be done every year, and, and this is done from home because you can uh, go to your government's website and uh, apply to have May declared as EDS and HSD Awareness Month. You can also do things like virtual fundraisers. Um, you know, hold a virtual uh, trivia tournament or um, virtual games. Maybe do virtual puzzles and raffles. I know we have so many creative people in our community. Think of ways, think maybe of five ways you could do a virtual fundraiser. What could you do? Either on Zoom, I know some people are using Minecraft or other video games platforms um, to create virtual events. And these ways, are ways that you can also use to, to teach others about EDS and HSD. You can also do advocacy with your government uh, from home. Just because we are uh, spending more time at home at this time does not mean that advocacy has to stop. Email or call your elected representatives, um, their staff in the, in the government departments, um, locally, nationally. Um, introduce yourself, of course, uh, but let them know what your thoughts are on an issue that's important to you. If, for instance, maybe they are um, considering um, whether they're going to require uh, buildings that were that don't have ramps into them that they're going to require buildings to to build a ramp then maybe you want to email or call them uh, the government representatives and let them know yes stay firm we want you to do this we want our community to be wheelchair accessible so pay attention, what are they working on right now? Are they working on issues that are important to you? If they aren't, why aren't they? Of course, when you're emailing or calling, um, you can very briefly, your elevator speech, very brief, concise explanation of what is EDS, what, what is HSD. Um, share that, that information with the staff of your elected representatives. Um, think about when you're sharing information, when you are letting them know what issues are important to you, let them know how our community are impacted. 
why is this issue important to you? Why should they change laws? Why, sh why should they create a new law? Why, what are we being impacted by? What would help us? Pay attention uh, to when public meetings or times of public comment are happening um, in your local, your state, your provincial or national government. Um, and be sure to submit your comments. Um, when there are public meetings, you can physically go there uh, and, and share your, your information and share what you want those officials to do. Um, you can find out when public meetings are, when there's public comment, by going to your government uh, website um, some governments allow, have a, a feature where you can be alerted when new laws are, are being considered, or you can be alerted whenever there's a public meeting, while others simply have a calendar of their meetings, and you can look through the calendar to see, are they having any meetings about things that are important to you, issues that are important to you? In your public comments, uh, whether they're written or in person, uh, be sure to, to share information about EDS and HSD in those laws. And, and be sure to include how, how does this make a difference to our community? How, how would our community be helped by or hurt by the, the, the changes in the laws being considered? Whenever you are advocating, whether from home or whether in person, be confident. You are the expert of you. Your story, your experiences are valid and they're valuable. You are the perfect advocate for you. You're, you're the perfect advocate for those whom you love. You're the perfect advocate for our community. I'm going to go through some advocacy tips. Many of these um, can be used when you are meeting in person, but they can also be used when you are doing meetings on Zoom or be used when you are making phone calls or when you're corresponding via email. It's always important to be courteous. Be concise when you can. Uh, government officials, the medical community, the researchers, they are very busy people. And so you don't wanna take up a lot of their time. Know where you can go for information. And, and be sure if you get asked a question and you don't know what the answer is, be comfortable saying, I don't know, but I'll get that answer for you. I'll let you know as soon as I find out. It's, it's okay to say, I don't know. You're not the expert of everything and that's okay. Practice what you're gonna say um, before you need to say it. That's going to help you feel more confident but it's also going to help you refine your message in a way that, that it can be heard. Treat others with the same respect and the same calmness that you wanna be treated. You don't wanna be treated um, in ways where people are yelling at you, right? Remember, it's about building partnerships. And so you want to treat people as calmly as you want to be treated. Um, when you're sending emails, <clears throat> if you are making social media posts, be sure you proofread. Proof it, read it several times. Excuse me. <clears throat> 
when one approach does not uh, work, try a different way. Try talking to a different person or try coming at the problem a different way or try suggesting a different solution. If what you're doing is not working, change how you are doing it, but still be persistent. This is going to take time. You know, you're going to, going to have to be patient, but you want to be persistent. Learn about your topic, not only about EDS and HSD, but the issues that are important to you. Let's go back to the example of an issue that's important to you maybe is wheelchair accessibility in your community. You want to be able to get into buildings, um, but many don't have ramps. So you would want to learn all about types of EDS and HSD, but you also want to learn um, which buildings in your community don't have ramps. You would want to learn what is the law now? Are buildings required to have a ramp in your community? Think about your goal. What are you wanting to accomplish? Going back to that exam example, your goal would be to make buildings in your community wheelchair accessible. have reasonable expectations. You know this is going to take time. And build partnerships, especially with the decision makers, but also with other advocates. Grow your network. Learning, setting a goal, reasonable expectations and building partnerships. These same strategies can be used anytime you advocate, whether in person or, or not, whether at home or out in the community. Whether you are advocating with doctors and at hospitals, whether you are advocating to get your needs met within your own family, or you're advocating uh, for the needs of your child at, at school or in the community with your government. The same basics apply. Learn about your topic, create a goal, have reasonable expectations, build partnerships. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I am going to talk just one more minute um, for everybody, I wanted to do this uh, when the slides weren't, weren't up there. When you're thinking about um, what kind of goal you want to do, when you want to think about the issues that are important to you, when you want to think about how are you going to get people to do what it is that you want to do to make the changes that you want made. Think about the head, think about the heart, think about the hands. So what do you want people to think about after you talk with them or after they read your social media post or after they read your email? What do you want them to think about? What do you want them to feel? the heart. What do you want them to, to feel? Do they, you want them to feel like they want to help you, but do you want them to feel sad? Do you want them to feel inspired? How do you want them to feel? But the most important thing, the hands. What do you want them to do? So when you're thinking about your elevator speech, when you're thinking about your message, making sure that it's concise and that it says 
you know, what it, you wanted to say, that it addresses the issues that are important to you, that it presents the problem, but also presents the solutions. What do you want them to think? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? Um, with that, S. Joe, I turn it over to you. All righty, thank you so much, Shane, um, for all your hard work, not only on this webinar, but every day you're out there helping individuals with EDS and HSD get the assistance they need and advocating for our community. Um, we have a couple questions in during the webinar, and we have a couple questions and comments in from email as well. Um, so just a reminder, if you haven't submitted a question but have one, um, go ahead and drop it in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to it. Um, the first one, we're going to go with a comment. I want to say thank you. Um, after your talk on advocacy last year, our support group takes a weekend out, takes a few weekends out a year, and takes brochures and information to local doctors, clinics, and hospitals, and it has helped so many of our support group get the help they need. Um, so that's really cool Excellent. to see. Um, Excellent. Yay for you. We had another comment in chat, which was really, really pertinent. Um, somebody said, yes, showing places that are not accessible for wheelchair users not only raises awareness about EDS, but also benefits all wheelchair users. Um, exactly. So that's really cool. And they also mentioned that um, if you encounter barriers to access, consider partnering with your local center for independent living as well, if you have one. So that's really cool um, to see this level of interaction and how people are advocating already. Um, mm -hmm. so well, and, and those are perfect examples of identifying which community are you representing. It may not always be the EDS and HSD community. In this particular example that I use, it's, it's wheelchair users are the community that you would be um, advocating for. And yes, connecting with other advocates like the community resource um, in the community is exactly what you want to do. Excellent examples. Thank you for sharing them. Um, first question is, my son's best friend was just diagnosed with EDS, and he was wondering what he can do to help advocate for his friend, not only in life, but especially at school. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it can be a, a challenge at schools. Um, some of it depends on how old uh the, the child is, you know, uh, there's different advocacy that happens in a kindergarten versus a middle school versus a high school, right? Or versus a college for that in, uh, or university for that matter. Um, and so the advocacy um, is always going to be, uh, and the awareness um, sharing is always going to need to be age appropriate. Um, and so helping um, your son, helping uh, also the child who has been diagnosed with a type of EDS uh, explain um, the condition in, in a level that, that is understandable to, to them, but their classmates as well um, is important. Um, they can do anything from uh, having it, uh, an assembly in school uh, when, when at such time when school returns um, to in person, um, where a student uh, can share what their condition is, or they can do a, a project um, and present it to a class, or they can take a wall, a bulletin board in the school um, and share information on that wall. Um, <clears throat> about these conditions. There's a number of ways uh, to do that. Um, since we're needing to do this from home right now, uh, maybe working on a project of how could you um, explain EDS and HSD in, in a way that the, the peers, the other students are going to understand and care about. Maybe creating a PowerPoint slide um, and maybe your teacher would would allow uh, time to present um, a PowerPoint slide about these conditions. Um, maybe talking about are there needs being met in the school? Uh, what, what changes need to be made 
um, for them to have their needs met. Um, and, and doing advocacy for that uh, can be another way. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, another question that came in was to keep the information and message about EDS consistent and accurate, is there any type of advocate certification that has been considered? And another question actually talked about the ECHO patient advocate and if that was going to happen again and if there's more information on that. So um, best way to keep um, the message accurate and consistent. Mm -hmm. The best uh, way to keep the message accurate and consistent, um, two things. One, uh, make sure you're getting your information from a reputable source. Let's say you're getting your information from the Eller Stano Society. Uh, then you know that the information is accurate. Secondly, write everything out before, before you spread awareness, before you say your message, um, before you use that uh, to proofread it. Are you um, consistent throughout your message? Or are there ways to make your message more concise? or to make your message more powerful. Write everything out, um, but proofread. And then use your family, your friends um, to speak your message. Practice with them to see how is it um, from the, the audience's perspective. Are they picking up inconsistencies? Do they feel moved? Do they wanna make changes on your behalf? Are they convinced that the issues you present are important ones? Um, and something else that I should mention too, when you are writing up your message or, or before you are talking to these decision makers, be sure that you do not begin with EDS and HSD. You and I use those as shorthand. We know what we're talking about. But for individuals who don't know what these conditions are, we need to completely um, spell it out for them. We need to say Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. We need to say hypermobility spectrum disorders. We can then go on to, to mention, which is abbreviated EDS and HSD. Uh, but when we are speaking to people who don't even know what these conditions are, we need to say the names of these conditions, not the abbreviations. Now then, about advocacy training. Um, I am the facilitator for Advocacy ECHO that we offer. Uh, we just recently completed our second cohort of um, advocacy trainees. We are currently accepting applications uh, for our third cohort. Uh, the uh, Third cohort will have meetings uh, through June and July, um, so this summer. And uh, I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe the applications are um, being accepted until May 20th. Right, thank you so much, Sandy. And another thing to point out as well, that to keep um, the messaging consistent, make sure you're using the proper terms as well. Um, the more recent names, uh, you know, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, um, just so people are up with the most current terminology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, our next question is, um, I wanted to take on the proclamation challenge for May, but it seems like my local government is too busy with COVID-19 related activities and planning to respond to my request for a proclamation. Any advice? This is a time where governments are particularly busy. Uh, that is true. If they can get uh, to your request for a pro proclamation, uh, which hopefully they will, um, uh, then you'll still get your proclamation. It may be by the end of May, but they may retroactively do it if they're really behind, you know. Um, but you can also think about uh, this in your plans for next year's uh, May EDS and HSD Awareness Month. And so you may 
start in January or February uh, requesting the proclamation that may be declared EDS and HSD Awareness Month. Um, so sometimes just starting earlier can help. Um, but thank you so very much uh, for um, applying to have May recognized as EDS and HSD Awareness Month where you live. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this year, this year has thrown a lot at us. Um, so I guess the best thing our community can do is just roll with the punches and, and do our best. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got two more questions. Uh, we should have enough time to get them in. Um, do you know any ways to best connect with others in my area to combine or com to combine our advocacy effort? Mm -hmm. You bet. Uh, connecting with others uh, not only is more fun, but you're right, it really strengthens your message as well. Local EDS and HSD support groups can be great resources for this. If you look on our website uh, under community resources, um, you can uh, find the local support groups uh, closest to you. Connect with those. Uh, and you can work with those um, members um, on an issues that are important uh, to all of you. But also remember that issues that are important to you may be important to others outside of the EDS and HSD community. And so you can connect with patient organizations, with uh, support groups for other conditions, um, with other national organizations or international organizations uh, who are also advocating for issues that are important to you um, to connect with them. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, and last question, um, what is the best way to keep explanations balanced? I don't want to drown people with too much information, but I also don't want them to feel offended by feeling that I am talking too simple to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really about learning your audience. Um, remember when I talked about um, you need to learn as much as you can about um, who are the decision makers? Who are you going to be talking with? Um, one of the things you want to find out when you are uh, doing that research is uh, what is their level of understanding of scientific information? You know that when you're, uh, for instance, doing a talk um, at a medical school uh, class, um, they may be under, able to understand uh, some more of the scientific information than uh, maybe the members of your town council um, when you are speaking in front of them, right? And so those are two very different audiences a classroom of medical students versus your town council. Uh, and so you want to tailor your message. It, the same issue may be important uh, to you and, the, and what you want may be similar. But let's go back to head, heart, hands. With that medical uh, school classroom, you may want to appeal to their head more. They deal in facts, right? Um, so you want, might want your message to be uh, a little bit more um, scientific language heavy, right? Um, but going to head, heart, hands for the town council, you wanna give them facts, but maybe they would be moved more um, if you made them feel something. And so your message to them may rely more heavily on your story to help connect, to help them decide what's important um, to you. In both cases, you know, with a medical school student, you may, what you may want them to do may be to learn about these conditions and, and identify these conditions and patients that they see throughout their career. In the town council meeting, um, what you may want them to do is also know about these conditions, but 
you want them to require all businesses have ramps except to make their, their buildings accessible. And so what you have them do may be different as well. So remember, head, heart, hands. What do you want them to think? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? That's what you can use to tailor that message. All righty, thank you so much, Sean. But that's all the time we have for our webinar today. You've provided a lot of great and important information that can really make a difference in the lives of individuals with EDS and HSD and gave some really good advice on how we can better advocate for ourselves in our community, especially during Awareness Month. Um, if anybody would like more information about anything that was presented today, please check out our website for resources information, give our helpline a call or an email, and definitely consider signing up for our newsletter if you haven't already. It's a fantastic source for the most up-to-date information and upcoming events. Our next webinar will be on May 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We have Jane Simmons and Siddharth Prakash joining us to talk on the topic of physiotherapy in vascular EDS. You can look out for that sign up for our next webinar on our website and various social media platforms very soon. Now, technology permitting, this webinar should be available on our YouTube channel and website within the next week or so. Now, if you found this webinar helpful in any ways, please consider hitting that like button once it's posted on YouTube and subscribe to our channel so that you can be alerted to when we're uploading our newest videos. Once again, thank you so much, Shaney, as usual. Tons of helpful information, tons of support for our community. Um, so thank you for being you and thank you for being so dedicated. Um, I hope that you and everyone that joined us today has a safe and healthy rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody.